right, folks, well, I'm seeing 10.02. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the November 3rd Thursday Web Forum, which will be our final web forum of 2020. Uh, my name's Hillary Morris. As always, I do user support and communications for both the South Atlantic and the Southeast Conservation Blueprints. And we host this webinar here at 10 a.m. just to give folks like you a chance to provide input and ask questions to help guide the conservation future of the South Atlantic region. So we're going to be sticking with Teams as our platform for this webinar for the foreseeable future, just so that we can continue to run the audio and the video through the same connection. That seems to have been more convenient for folks. So I will ask that you keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation and maybe hide your video as well. I do have the power to mute everybody, but I'd rather not use it unless we get lots of background noise. And then lastly, as a heads up, we are recording this web forum. I always do that just as an option for the one or two people who inevitably wanted to come but couldn't make it at this time. So I'll put the link to the web recording and the link to the slides on the calendar event from the South Atlantic LCC website um, within a couple days of today's talk. So any questions or comments before we jump in? All right, so here's our usual agenda. I start out by introducing our speaker, then we'll have the main talk for 30 to 40 minutes or so. We'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions and discussion, and then I'll wrap up by previewing next month's webinar, or in this case, January's webinar, since we'll be skipping December. So today's talk will be given by Rua Mordecai, who I'm sure you all know. He's the coordinator of the South Atlantic and the Southeast Conservation Blueprints, and he'll be wearing his South Atlantic hat today and talking about the improvements that we're working on for the next version of the South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint. So uh, Rua, with that, I will quit sharing and hand things over to you. Awesome. All right, thanks, Hillary. So I will go ahead and share the screen and share this one. All right, so this is my favorite. This is my favorite time of year. Blueprint improvements, super fun. Got a, I like to think about it like a big tasty buffet in front of us. You know, you got all these tasty dishes in here and um, it's kind of quite a feast this time of year. And so, you know, but also just like a buffet, sometimes you look at something like that cake right in the middle there, and it's just like, I just want to eat that whole cake. And sometimes with indicators, we kind of want to do that, um, just dive in and, and make all these big improvements with in one specific indicator, but then we'll be full, we won't have room for everything else. Um, and so this is a super exciting time, but also a challenging time of, of kind of figuring out what we're going to, what little tasty bits we're going to be able to move forward on the indicators themselves. Um, so our, our plan, you think about it like a, a menu in some ways, we sort of split out the different types of improvements we want to do as part of our strategy for tackling this tasty buffet. Um, and so basically we're kind of looking at doing, starting with the marine and coastal indicators, which really didn't get that much love uh, for the last blueprint update, and then working our way to freshwater and terrestrial. We're not sure which of those are going to be the order yet. But basically, we are, um, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of the progress we've made in some of these things. Um, but the way we've kind of prioritized these has been based on Blueprint users, workshops, and then, you know, on webinars like this, when people bring up, you know what I'd really like to see you work on. Um, so we try to condense all that and, and we use that to prioritize from this huge giant buffet of improvements we can have um, and make it a little bit more manageable for the yearly update cycle. So I'm just going to go through some stuff in the works. I'm not going to cover everything um, and I'm not going to promise that like any of these individual ones will actually make it into a, a final indicator this year because we never know what weird bumps we're going to run into, but just give you a flavor. And then we'll talk a little bit afterwards and kind of get a sense of, of yeah, what, what kind of stuff you'd like to see. All right, so starting in, let's go deep in the Marine. Um, this one's actually pretty close to done. Uh, this is an image of the old indicator from, from 2020 um, that we're going to be updating this year. So um, we've already rerun and done most of the processing um, with more updated data. Uh, so we're getting really close on this one. Not quite that I could show you a new picture yet. Um, but the new updated data from the folks at the, the Duke Marine Lab and, and other folks fixes one of our known issues with the right whale wintering abundance not going kind of far enough offshore. And so that's exciting. Fixed a few other issues, too, and some other nice improvements. Um, so this one might be one of the first ones that gets that gets finalized. It's really not too bad to kind of just update based on newer, better data. 
Um, and it also looks like this will be a little later in the process, but I got my fingers crossed. Um, I think we've got a strategy to be able to use these data to depict marine mammal corridors. So we've gotten a lot of comments and workshops and things about our marine corridors, um, you know, about whether they totally make sense or like what they're representing. And so um, fingers crossed, we want to try to dive in and, and see if we can rethink the marine corridors. And I think we can do a marine mammal kind of approach, looking at how their distributions change over the seasons um, to get some, basically some marine mammal corridors. And we could pull them out at a species level to kind of be like, okay, here are the species that are moving in these different places. Um, so that's a little bit later in our in our process, but also excited to be able to do that because a lot of people have talked about the corridors in the marine environment. Uh, potential hard bottom condition. Uh, so um, we're working on, we have our hard bottom indicator. So on the right, that's short in black. Um, but one of the things we've, we have is that we're kind of undercounting some of the um, deep water coral areas. And that's definitely come up in some new, um, some new dives they've done, found some new deep water coral. Um, our hard bottom indicator is a little older um, in some of the data. And so we're looking at using a deep water coral habitat suitability model to complement our, our current hard bottom condition. And scoping that out, that did a good job of predicting the new deep water coral sites they found off South Carolina. Um, so we're hopeful that that will capture not just the new ones we're discovering, but ones we haven't found quite yet. So we are working on that one right now. And then as we start going closer into the shore, we are looking at basically expanding and improving our unaltered beach indicator to with some better data, but also to cover the full shoreline. Uh, so what you're looking at here, this is Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. So the red areas are kind of marsh edges, the green, you know, these are beaches, but we also have some alteration as well. So the yellow areas, which are kind of hard to see, are riprap, and the blue areas are man-made hardened structures. Um, so we think we can capture, you know, we're still scoping this out, but we've got some data on the shoreline that if we can capture overall sort of shoreline condition. That's another thing that's come up about, you know, sort of living shorelines, hardening, it's come up a lot of the workshops and from different users. Um, and so now that this, the shoreline data from NOAA is also synced across the different states. Uh, a bunch of years ago, uh, South Carolina, I think in particular, was much older than everyone else. And so there, there was going to be some disparity across state lines. But now we have 2015, 2016 data for all the South Atlantic states. So that means we can do it consistently across the geography, which is exciting. So that's a shoreline condition thing we are scooping. And now let's go, um, oh, no, actually beach birds. Uh, this is another thing, question mark, um, kind of beach birds is some of our older data. It's got some issues, especially in a few known really important shorebird sites that it was missing data in. And so we also think that environmental sensitivity index NOAA, from NOAA might be able to help us update the indicator and potentially resolve some known issues. What you're seeing now is uh, basically distribution of some our beach bird index species sort of during different seasons so that the red is looking at distribution of American oyster catcher uh, during the nesting season. The yellow is kind of wintering piping plover. So we're looking into that um, using that data or complementing with some other things into improving our beach birds. Uh, so that's going to help us with some resolution issues, some data that's not being updated, whereas this, this data at least does get updated into the future. So we'll see, but fingers crossed, it'd be cool to update our beach birds indicator. Now going a little bit farther back, um, maritime forest extent. So we have got some comments, especially from Blueprint users, about um, issues with the maritime forest distribution. It is fairly, it is much older. Um, we got it from the individual states before, and so Louise has been going back and um, working with the different states to try to see if we can get some more refreshed information and numbers. So here we are, Kill Level Hills in North Carolina. Um, and so a few of the things we're, we're looking at, the, the Black areas are sort of known maritime forest. Uh, the reds are already developed areas. And the, the green is looking at historic maritime forest potential distribution. And so we're thinking right now, still exploring stuff that we may 
try something to merge that in between. So like in Georgia, they haven't updated their data in a long time, but we can then maybe just use the, the de already developed. So if it's that maritime forest has been developed, we can pull it out from being developed. Uh, same thing with historic. You know, if we take the historic maritime forest, maybe those are places where there's, there's opportunities uh, compared to it, it was maritime forest, but now it's someone's house, basically a big development. Uh, so that's what we're looking at right now, kind of blend state data and, and land fire, historic maritime, and then the developed state to see what we can do. All right, maritime forest. Now let's go a little bit more in. So now we're we've kind of don't have as many pretty pictures. Actually, I do after this. Um, so freshwater updates. Uh, there are a few things we're working on to sync more consistently with the Southeast Aquatic Resources Partnership and also uh, with neighboring inputs to the Southeast Blueprint. So we're looking at updating our network complexity. So that's one of the connectivity measures, aquatic connectivity measures we use in the Blueprint. And um, basically, uh, Tad and the folks at SARP have been doing, that's a ton of folks that have been doing an awesome job with getting much better data on, on aquatic connectivity and dams and the barrier assessment. And so we're about due to refresh network complexity in a way that will sync across what you see in the barrier assessment tool with SARP, um, which you see in other places. And then also we're looking at updating our imperiled aquatics indicator um, based on the number of aquatic swap species, which actually seems to be a pretty good job of capturing the patterns we already have, filling in some gaps that we've seen in the workshops where people have said, hey, I think we're under prioritizing this particular area. Um, and that's something that is regularly refreshed and improved by SARP. Um, so we're excited about the potential there. That's something we're looking into. And then also we're looking uh, into how to deal with the areas within the open water reservoirs. That was a comment that came up a lot in some of the virtual workshops. Um, where we're not prioritizing anything in the reservoirs right now. So we are looking at some stuff to try to see, can we tease out some of the shallow water areas and the areas that might be important for waterfowl and, and other species within the reservoir itself. Um, so we're looking at a bunch of different things, but that's also potential, question mark, but exciting. All right, now on to more pictures. Um, so urban open space is another thing that we, we've actually used quite a bit in, in helping users. And um, one of the things we want to work on is reducing some of the edge effects with the urban open space indicator. Because we use the census definition of quote, quote unquote what's urban, it makes this sort of hard line in the indicator and it's sort of value to residents. And um, when we first created the indicator, we, we wanted to deal with that and make it more of a softer transition, um, kind of rethink how we did it, but we just ran out of time. Uh, so that's one thing we want to look at and also addressing an issue we found on military bases uh, specifically during some of the workshops for blueprint 2020 um, because the military bases are treated as like protected areas there were some spots that were actually you know literally like developed residential cities <laughs> parts of the military bases that were coming up as uh, as kind of existing urban open space and so I think we want to also look at, see if there's a way we can fix that as well. Uh, so those are the things we're, we're thinking about. Let's get to urban open space, uh, fire in the coastal plain. Um, this is, we're hoping to have some new data based on Landsat burned areas by the end of the year. Very excited about this piece. Gotten a lot of comments and interest on, on the fire parts of the indicator. That's one that's older, has a book has a bunch of known issues and we've been really raring to fix. So this was part of the Southeast fire map project, um, which came from a number of different sources and was funded um, from NRCS as starting point for a significant amount of money to move this forward, a better capture burn history across the, the Southeast. And uh, um, yeah, actually even the need for better fire stuff within the blueprint was part of um, what got that funded, which is pretty exciting. Um, so this is based on Landsat burned areas, so 30 meter pixels, and um, we're hoping to have it for all those kind of squares you see across the long leaf range. Um, the folks at Joe Noble and the folks at Tall Timbers have been doing an amazing job working on this and have been super supportive and um, moving this one forward. So we're hoping by the end of the year, we might actually have some 
uh, some data to get much better at our sort of burned areas uh, indicators, at least within the coastal plain and within the long leaf range. Another one is we're working on is grassland condition. Uh, in this case, for the South Atlantic, it would be Piedmont Prairie condition, but we're also trying to make this in a consistent way that will cut across the work that's being done in the Middle Southeast and some other areas so we can eventually build to a Southeast wide grassland condition indicator. So we're trying to sync up methods so that they'll make sense together. Uh, what we're looking at right now um, as potential that would be consistent is thinking about a combination of known prairies, uh, power lines and roadsides where you're kind of in the right condition and looking at the grassland-ish classes in the National Land Cover data set. So you see just an example here, it's kind of like the darker green is known prairie, the lighter green is, you know, kind of more natural habitat, you know, potential prairie habitat along power line corridors. So that's what these guys are right here, power line corridors, um, where there's potential habitat there. And the yellow is basically other grassland. Um, so mostly pasture um, and, and classes that Piedmont prairies get kind of lumped into. So we don't totally know um, exactly what they are. And so that's why it would be kind of in the lower one. So that's what we're looking at. And we're looking at trying to make that consistent um, across a broader area of the Southeast. So I have my fingers crossed that hopefully we could also get something like this ready for next year as well. So, and just here's the timeline for the 2021 update, just so you get a sense of what happens throughout the year. So basically the plan is by February to have the indicators and their documentation 90% finalized. So basically try to lock up and finish as much as we can but just leave a little bit of space in case we want to try to fix some indicators based on blueprint review and, and workshops and things like that. So that's the plan there. March is when we start kind of running the prioritization, doing the connectivity analysis, and we're planning on having a draft blueprint in April. So y'all can take a look at it and do some initial reviews, queue up for some workshops in May. And then after that, just like usual, we try to like incorporate the blueprint, rerun the thing based on feedback from you. We did that last year. We're hoping to be able to do that again. And then August 15th is our sort of drop dead deadline for having all the data and documentation final. Um, so that's going to be the same way through that Southeast, um, but that is our down, that's our kind of drop dead date for the South Atlantic blueprint where we should have everything all tucked up, finalized, documented, ready for you to use. It'll take a little longer to get into viewers and things like that. Um, but that's our, basically the plan timeline for this year. So now, after we've gone on this fun voyage through Blueprint updates, uh, first I was gonna stop, see if y'all had any questions about any of those updates and things we're working on. And then after that, just, just get a sense if there's um, other stuff. That, that comes to mind that you'd like us to work on or, or things in particular that I mentioned that you're like, yes, yes, do that. Do that. <laughs> uh, so I will stop here for questions. Hi, this is Gail. Um, I saw, okay. I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, do you have a Carolina Bay indicator? Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that one. Oh, and I should have done some pictures. Okay, so. Um, um, I can actually pull it up in a second. So basically we've been working on Carolina Bays as an indicator and we have, um, uh, we now have kind of like historic bay layer that's actually pretty awesome. Um, and working with, um, somebody that had been working on it from a kind of geological standpoint and just data was a little harder to access and get through. So we worked on a bunch of stuff, crunching turn it into shape files. The downside is that we don't have full coverage of the South Atlantic. It basically peters out. I'll stop sharing my screen in a second and see if I can find it. But it basically peters out around like kind of the North Florida, a little bit of Southern Georgia area. So it's something that we'll probably can still share and do in user support. 
um, but it will be harder to get into the blueprint since we don't have full coverage of the, the South Atlantic region. So a lot of the bays do get, the big bays get covered from a bunch of other indicators. Um, but yeah, we, I was very sad because we got so far on that one and I was hoping to have one um, ready for, for this update until we found out that we were missing some of those data down there. So data will still help make the, the data on sort of historic bays and um, things accessible. In fact, here, let me show derp or derp. Here we go. Share my screen again. Um, these are actually sort of like the locations based on the, the shape files that we helped put together. Um, so we stop at about, where do we stop? So step one of the bays was getting the actual geophysical markers of where the bays are. So you can see kind of where we stop in southern Georgia and Florida. So I'm working with the person that did this to see if they can see if they'll expand farther down. Um, this is using a lot of like very high resolution um, satellite data. And that's how they've kind of been able to pick out the bays at this level of resolution. Um, so yeah, it stops about there, but we are going to share this. And then we've also gone a little bit down the path of, um, you know, being able to then filter it down by land cover as well to kind of get it like, okay, here's the bays, but where are the bays that are still in reasonable, reasonably good condition? Um, one of the interesting things, I think I was zoomed in here automatically here, was, you know, you kind of think about these bays as created by like, you know, impact. Um, from from things historically and you look at like it's like oh how do you make lake wakama oh well three big impacts <laughs> turns it into a really shallow lake instead of just like a carolina bay it's like oh that's kind of interesting um so yeah i have this uh still working on getting this up um through their their site um but we have this that we can help people with right now this and some land cover underneath to capture bay condition but because we're short down there, we probably won't be able to incorporate in the blueprint um, because we don't want to penalize the, the farther south um, Georgia and Florida folks for just not having data yet. OK, great. Thanks. So that layer itself won't won't be available for download or use. Or... We can't. No, I will okay. make it. I'm going to work. Okay. Yeah. So basically, like I'm I'm going to work to make this layer available um, probably through a different through their own kind of portal that they have and then make that shareable. Um, but yeah, we'll work on figuring out the best way to because um, there's nothing secret about it. I mean, it's it's up. It's up right now on their site. It's just impossible to use <laughs> in TIS. You can look at it, but it's a hot mess. So it took a lot of scripting and a lot of fun to get it to here. Um, but yeah, we'll make sure that you can you can download it and use it. There's nothing secret about it or anything like that. And in fact, if you need it sooner rather than later, at least these historic bays, I could just send it to you before we get it up if you'd like. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? Writing myself a note real quick. I don't forget. Cool. All right. Um, the other thing I wanted to open it up for is just to see if y'all had any particular. Now you got a sense of what we've been working on based on the feedback so far. Are there any of those particular? Either do you have some other indicators that you think you want us to try to dive into this year, um, or are those? Any of those indicators I mentioned already, particularly like, oh, yes, yes, important to you. Um, and I think, yeah, I'll, I'll throw it open and then I might just call on some people. <laughs> All right, I'm calling on people now. Um, all right, uh, maybe I'll start with. If 
with Gail, you mentioned the Carolina Bays, um, which is, yeah, that's, you've heard that and I've sent that. Anything in particular, anything else missing that you, that you think would be important to work on this year or any of those things that I talked about particularly important for you? Um, no, I, it looks great. I don't have any other comments or questions or suggestions. Cool. Just check in. Um, let's see. I see. Maybe I'm just going to call on. And you can always pass if I call on you. I don't, I don't put everyone on the spot. You can pass. Um, but let's see. Um, Michael. Michael Wright. You might be on mute or just away from your desk, which is fine too, but. <laughs> also possible. Let's see. All right, and you can also put it in the chat too. Um, chat is all good, especially with audio and adventures. Yeah, ah, Michael says I don't have a mic hooked up, so. Yeah, mm -hmm. all good. No worries. Uh, so yeah, if you wanna just drop that in the chat, anything in particular you want us to kind of dive into or things to look at, that's all good as well. Um, and while you're chewing on that, maybe, um, let's see, William. Yeah, I didn't have anything anything else to add. I've never really worked with the blueprint before, so I think this was a really good introduction because I think I'll be working with it moving forward. So I'll probably have questions as I dive into your various data sets, but, but I don't have any questions right now. Awesome. Yeah, we got we got some good stuff on the um, yes. If you run into questions or things like that, um, feel free to reach out to Hillary or myself, and we can run you through some stuff. It's quite a tasty feast. Cool. Um, well, if you think about anything else in the meantime, stuff to dive into, stuff to suggest, feel free to um, drop it in the chat or just go ahead and send us. Um, Send either one of us, me or Hillary, an email. No, he got Hillary's email because he probably got the reminder. Um, so yeah, just drop us a line and I'll hand it back to you, Hillary. Sure. All right. Well, I'm just going to wrap up with a quick preview of next month's web forum. And um, Will, since you're on, please feel free to um, correct me or fill in any blanks um, because Will Casola with NC State is going to be giving our next talk, which, as I mentioned, will be in 2021. That'll be January 21st, 2021. We always skip the December web forum um due to the holidays so let's see have i managed to share my screen which i always forget to do i have not so let's look at this preview slide for will so yeah he's gonna be talking about a great project um on determining the use economic impacts and value of game land in north carolina and i put and beyond because this project is looking to expand to at least south carolina and georgia and even as of yesterday, um, there was maybe some talk about even expanding it to the whole southeast wide uh, seacoast geography, which would obviously be great. Um, so he's looking at market impacts of visitors to game lands, as well as the non-market value to locals who are obviously getting a lot of non-market benefits like aesthetics, ecosystem services, recreational opportunities. So he's quantifying the use of these game lands, the market contribution of these properties to their local economies. Um, as well as those non-market values to management agencies and local governments. So as North Carolina and the Southeast more broadly urbanizes, obviously protecting green space like game lands, it does reduce the overall acreage of tax land, but he's showing that that can actually strengthen the local tax base by increasing property value um, of nearby properties and by generating a lot of associated economic activity with people coming to those game lands to use them. So really interesting look at those sorts of dynamics and some great applications to cost and benefits of game lands, highlighting instances where they're currently an underutilized source of, source of economic growth. And then obviously, as we estimate the use of public green space, that's gonna improve our understanding of how various groups use these sorts of amenities. So, well, if you have anything to add, please jump in, but we're really excited for your talk. Nope, I think you covered it well. Um, looking forward to it. And I'll see everybody back in January. Yeah. Be here sooner than we think. What a weird year. <laughs> Half the time I feel like we're still in March. Um, 
So lastly, I always end on this slide, just how to get more involved in the blueprint. I do encourage you to join the South Atlantic web community at southatlanticlcc.org. If you create an account on our website, that will get you signed up for our monthly newsletter and a monthly reminder email about this web forum. Uh, always encourage you to connect with your blueprint staff. That's me and Rua and Mallory, Louise, Amy in Raleigh, North Carolina. And of course, please explore the conservation blueprint. That's the, the URL for the blueprint page, and that'll get you to download the data to explore it in our cool viewers and all sorts of other good stuff. But we're here to help you. Um, anybody else have any questions before we sign off? You get 30 minutes back in your morning today. <laughs> I'm going to unshare so I can see people. If not, um, enjoy the rest of your morning and thanks so much for tuning in. Appreciate the presentation today, Rua. That was great. Yeah. Good seeing everybody. Thanks, y'all. Bye, y'all.